seeing the presence of a quorum, uh, we'll call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee at 6.33 p.m. Uh, we, uh, we don't have minutes to approve this time, so we'll, get, we'll hit them next time. Uh, so the first order of business is announcements and public comment. Are there any announcements from the committee? Yes, Mr. Gumbel. I have three, and I'll be real quick. All right. All right. Uh, so our special ed uh, survey is uh, continues to be open. It closes on March 22nd. Uh, if you've received that in email, please uh, go on and fill it out. It's very valuable information. You can always also click to it at arps.org. Uh, anyone in any of the the Amherst Pelham Regional School Districts. Um, uh, an, a big shout out again to our brothers and sisters in the organized labor movement out in Oakland, yeah. scoring a big victory against the forces of privatization against public schools, um, contributing with LA and forcing a transparency law at the state level. Um, they also got a great contract and other uh, pushback. So as we are going on our own efforts to be inspired at the state level to push back on some things that we will talk about in a little bit, um, always good to see those victories happen across the, the country. Uh, and the last, I just wanted to give a shout out to the um, the musical, all the students and staff that participated in, in what is the, um, outside of graduation, the largest student activity. Um, it's, it's amazing, not just, to, not just for the performers and the musicians, but um, at, at the end when they all come on, you know, the wave after wave of, of all the students in black shirts, you know, the techies and the lighting and the craft designers, it's just really impressive uh, that we can do that at the high school and the turnout was, was fantastic, so great community event. Cool. Uh, any other announcements? Hearing none, uh, we are open for public comment. Uh, I don't know whether we have a, uh, the man with the a panoramic <laughs> lens on the uh, on the camera for Amherst Media, which I should actually remind people we're being taped uh, for uh, future broadcast on Amherst Media, which we deeply appreciate. Um, but if we had a panoramic lens, we would see there not, in fact, anyone sitting in the audience, unless Mr. Mangano wants to freelance and come up, and you do not. <laughs> Uh, so we will move forward. Um, are there subcommittee updates, including time. our illustrious? What do you want? Strategic plan? Facilities use? Facilities use. Facilities use. Yeah. It was big we'll thinking. It. Important committee. Um, yeah. No, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I guess the update is last. I think at, right shortly after our last meeting, the facilities use board advisory board had another meeting with the public, <coughs> um, and at which they toured the middle school. And I think that some, a lot of helpful feedback came out of that from the mm -hmm. members of the public that were there. Um, so we should be looking for a presentation from the architects quite soon that I think will include a range of options um, in terms of costs and different, you know, just like how deep the renovations would go or not go. So it should be interesting. Great. Uh, and I think we actually have that on the agenda next time for the regional committee. That's right, and the 26th will be their final report. Right, so you can look forward to that then. Uh, are there other subcommittees that wish to report anything? Keep looking. No. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, so the sub subcommittee updates. Um, do you have an update? For the superintendent? Yes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> okay so he has several updates here. On the district level, he mentioned he has um, the Amherst Regional High School, the middle school in Wildwood. There were some students from there who joined in the Special Olympics that was um, run by the South Hadley High School students. Our students enjoyed activities such as basketball drills, bowling, a giant Jenga, and some other cooperative games, and they had a wonderful time. Also, we had uh, National Breakfast Week last week, and it culminated with an event at Fort River with Congressman Jim McGovern and other members of this committee, as well as parents and uh, guardians who attended, and they had a great time, and they talked about um, alternative breakfast models. Project Bread and Blue Cross and Blue Shield was there, and the school has received a grant for $8,000 to continue um, with the program. Also, as Peter Demling mentioned, the family survey for the PCG, or the um, Special Ed Survey, has gone out with a return date or end date of March 22nd. And we had uh, conducted this survey previously, and so now we're just looking to make sh you know, see how we're doing. We ask all parents and guardians of students who are currently on IEP to provide feedback if you have more than one student who are on IEP to do two separate 
or as many separate surveys for each child as needed. And then on the secondary level, we have a Geography B winner, mm -hmm. and he's from the middle school. His name is Cameron Gray Lee, and he now qualifies for the Massachusetts State Level B, which will take place on March 29th. We wish, wish him well in that um, endeavor. Also, the College Board has um, sent us a letter stating that we have won an award for the Computer Science Female Diversity. We, have, we are one of only 685 schools that have achieved diversity in um, the computer science area. So there are 18,000 secondary schools worldwide that offer a AP courses. And for us to achieve this great um, recognition is, is really fascinating and, and great. Um, and it's a quote from them in their letter to us says, by your leadership in this area, you prepare your female students for the high paying in demand jobs of the future and give them the opportunity to help solve some of society's most challenging problems. So kudos to the high school and what they're doing for that. Um, on Friday, there is the talk of some of our students wanting to participate in the youth climate strike. And so the administrators at the secondary level have been in communication with the police department and with the students just to make sure that student safety is a top priority for the district and make sure that they are safe in whatever they choose to do. So if they choose to walk out and participate, mm -hmm. there are police officers who will be assigned to assist and this is not a school-sponsored event. So even though we're working with the police department to make sure that our students are safe, it's not a school-sponsored event. And that's all that I have. Wonderful. Are there any questions for the assistant superintendent? Is I just have one clarification question regarding the uh, youth climate strike on Friday. Because mm -hmm. I noticed in the letter that the superintendent had sent around a draft to the committee, um, <clears throat> he had stated that the police department was going to be sharing a police officer for safety of the students. Right. But then uh, immediately following, there was a line stating that the school is not responsible for the safety of the students. And so I'm wondering if there's any chaperones or anyone else, you know, any adults that will be accompanying the students, uh, or if it will only be this police officer. <laughs> So that's a great question, more than likely, and I don't know the exact answer to that, but more than likely the adults will still remain in the building for those who choose to stay and uh, continue their day. So since it's not school sponsored, I wouldn't believe that our teachers would be out there with them. We would let the, uh, the officers continue with the walk and chaperoning the students there. Yeah, please. Just to follow up, because I think believe in uh, students' parents, uh, you know, or guardians have to mm -hmm. sign a they release, do. right? Yes. Um, so, with this release, are parents and guardians basically saying that they relinquish control, or, or um, that they're not they're holding the, the district, you know, I guess at no harm for mm -hmm. if something happens to the students. Just want to know if we have a, a lot of high school students walking around downtown, even with the police presence, just want to make sure that they're, that somebody's there to, to keep an eye on them. Right. So your comment is great. Thing is, I only received the same letter you received. Okay. And I was not part of the planning. And so I can only re read the line to you that says uh, parents are required to send a note and sign and give permission for their child to leave the campus. And the parent would get the same letter knowing that it's just a police escort that would be there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can follow up with the superintendent separately then. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Um, we're done with the regional assessment working group. <laughs> so there's there's no there's no particular uh, shared report. Only I, I I would add though that I I had gotten outreach from a member of the public, um, keenly interested. I think the chair of the Amherst committee might have as well. Um, keenly interested in assessing the uh, the ability and the desirability of the district in adopting organic foods within our food service program, and uh, and. I, what I, I what we can talk about this later under school committee planning, but it was my thought that since we ha we have a new food service program and we have a new director, that the right way to handle an inquiry like that is actually to um, hear one refer the comment 
in the letter, but also to um, if we had a presentation later in the spring on food services, which I think makes sense entirely to do, um, to just flag this topic as something that will come up during that discussion. Yes. So Come was on. this from a community member, or was like was the origin of this inquiry? He was a member of our community. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but uh, activist and uh, uh, very vocal. No, I mean that sounds funny about it, but instead of like a, you get two kinds of inquiries in life. I think the kind that sort of say passingly, like if you run into somebody at Big Y, hey, I'm interested in this topic. I wonder if you guys are doing anything. And then there's the other kind of inquiry that says, I really think you should do something about this, and I'd like to draw your attention to it. And I hope you do. This is more like the latter. But I think it's worth. I think it's a worthwhile topic. I mean, we have talked a little bit about uh, organic foods or local foods. We haven't really dug into the topic at all. So I think it's actually worth talking about uh, wherever it goes. Uh, so on to new and continuing business. And the um, as as referenced earlier, but I guess I'm saying it on camera for anyone who missed this. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to do the presentation tonight on um, following up on the math report that we got. So we've reorganized the agenda and moved up a couple of items, uh, one being superintendent evaluation subcommittee and the second being advocacy efforts. And um, for the superintendent subcommittee, um, as I mentioned before, I know Audra's <coughs> not here, was I think you, Mr. Sullivan, yep. and Audra are the only two current members of the That's committee correct. who are on that subcommittee. Yeah. Um, so. If you would, if you would like to, or I'd actually appreciate it if you'd be willing to describe a little bit of the work that that committee did. Not like in the, you did everything, so not in like the grand scheme, but sort of more like when we're looking to this spring and what we'd want to be doing, um, what what the subcommittee would be tasked to do. Does that make sense to you? It does. We took the superintendent evaluation that's available online and we just kind of streamlined it a little bit to fit the Amherst region and then also Union 26 and um, did some work for Amherst also. Um, so that, I mean, that's really what all we did was we just took it and we, str we made it work for this district. But you guys did a great job of, of identifying like the standards and the rubrics and the objectives and stuff and oh yeah we did that you know too. tying them back to the <laughs> tying them back to the goals which i know we did yeah, some that, of that this past well, that, fall well that most of that work goal. fell to superintendent morris he's the one that really laid laid it out and then we just took right we took it and made boxes to fit the um these were awesome the, boxes they were yes they were awesome <laughs> boxes that then deb turned into an online form that was then used to review um the members of, you know, Dr. Morris, um, who's got to come forward in a little while with um, an update on how, on how he's doing, for want of a better term, but then also uh, in another couple months, come forward with his packet of evidence, and then, you know, we would review it and do our so evaluation. The, right, so what we, yeah, so we did, we took his packet of evidence and made it so that we could go through it and pull out the important pieces, and then everyone was able to go through and just check the correct box right so uh, the, this is of course might be a, a wonderful topic for if we were drawing like a hot cup of cocoa but it is relevant because the super the subcommittee needs to uh, form again and do that work again in anticipation of uh, the springs evaluation of the superintendent uh, and we need a member from each town. That's right. We, we, <laughs> felt, we felt that that was the best, was that there was yeah. a representative. It worked very well. It, it did. I mean, we, it worked We did really that for well. two years, though. I mean, to be fair, we did this yep. for two years, not just one. And it worked very well. Um, so if we have a member from Shootsbury, we, do. we would be honored to have that mm -hmm. person on again. Um, Audra, if she was here, I'd love to talk to, about her in front of her, but um, she ain't. So um, hopefully Ms. Kosensky is willing <coughs> to participate. It sounded like in our earlier conversation that she was. It sort of sounded like that. I it sounded that. like that, but I'm uh, not going to speak for her either. Well, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's the truth is, it's not as much work as it was. I don't think at this point, right? No, it's just. I mean, because I mean, initially you guys created from whole cloth the whole thing, and it was an enormous amount of work. I think there's something to work with now in terms of a framework to review and to meet with Dr. Morris. Um, so the, the bottom line is, we need somebody from Pelham and somebody from Amherst who's willing to volunteer for this. Absolutely. As people like to say, other than the budget, this is the most important task school committee does. 
When does it meet? When do you? When did you normally? I'm sure you arranged a time. But when did you, when did you guys meet? It was like f either five to six or five thirty to six thirty. It was late in the late in the afternoon. And one. How many meetings do you think you'd need this spring to put together the instrument for? Oh, probably just two, maybe three at the most. Okay. Because I mean, the the skeleton is really there. It's right. Just putting maybe a little bit more meat on it, but it. That makes complete it's, sense to me. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So we need a volunteer from Pelham and from Amherst. So that I understand the yes. evaluation form, I volunteered to be on the preparation of it. Cool. Okay, great. <laughs> Just mean I appreciate it. Is there a volunteer from I never the lovely town of Amherst? It, I would volunteer with the caveat that I'd need to work on scheduling it a bit. Well, so if, if there were flexibility a little bit in Last year, the, the bulk of it actually was done online. In that case, that works for me. Just awesome. Wonderful. In. It's coming in. I'm not volunteering. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say that I know many of your other committees, such as the policy subcommittee and such, reach out to the HR office or to me mm -hmm. to say, can you look at this and provide feedback? And so I'd like to offer that as an option to this committee because you're looking at evaluations in our office. We look at evaluations all the time. So just to offer that. I think that's wonderful. I mean, it's and also, um, not to sound funny about this, but even though Dr. Morris is great and he's giving us great feedback and advice, when we're thinking about structuring his evaluation, it'd probably be a good idea to have another professional who's not actually him uh, looking at it as, I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it seems like a good practice mm -hmm. to have someone else looking at it as well. Um, wonderful. So I, don't, I guess um, we'll probably try to offline connect with Ms. Gasensky on this as well, and then loop the four of you together. I don't know, Deb, if we, we can do that sometime this week, and, uh, and then you can get going. Mm -hmm. Sounds cool. good. Awesome. And actually, what we should do is maybe just a reminder, we should take whatever materials we had from last year and distribute them to the committee so you have a uh, head start to look at them. Does that make sense, Deb? Deb, do we have those around? Yes. Cool. What, what is our timeline on the region for the evaluation? Um, do you know when we're hoping to have it completed? Uh, we either said the end of May <coughs> or it was early June when we talked about it in September or October. Yeah. I mean, the challenge is, so the Amherst members are going to be uh, so basically, to back up for a second, the challenge traditionally has been of uh, when the members turn over, and um, it's, it sort of differs by town, right. as you know. And um, also, uh, member, former members, even if they have an amazing amount of experience with the superintendent, if you're what's called a former member of the committee, you're not allowed to fill out the evaluation. And so it's only current members who can do so. So one of the challenges is you try to pick a time of year when you have enough of the year done that you can fairly evaluate, reasonably evaluate um, the superintendent, but it's also not so far in the year <laughs> that you have, you know, at least in past years, theoretically, almost a completely new committee then doing the evaluation, which makes no sense. So the funny thing is my recollection, Mr. Sullivan, is that one of the first tasks of the subcommittee when you formed was to um, sit down with the superintendent, and maybe in this case with the assistant superintendent, uh, and draft a potential calendar for the end of the year. Yep. And then bring it back to the committee for discussion, which I'd anticipate we'd want to have for our meeting on the 26th. Because that, right, that was, the, that was the big thing we did, was firm up who could and who could not fill out the evaluation. <coughs> now, luckily, we got that straightened out. We got now. that straightened out, right. Because previously, we, we had quite an array of people who could fill it out. And we were wrong. The past is the past. <laughs> anyway, um, any other questions about this? Because I mean, it's, so it, it's an important body to work. The thing that I'm pleased about, though, is that the committee in the past, subcommittee in the past, always did a really wonderful job of bringing back all the important questions to the full committee to discuss. So it's, it's not like this committee is going to go off and then the next thing you know we're going to do doing an evaluation. There's going to be lots of touch points for us to be able to talk about what we think and make the decisions collectively. Uh, I think just one suggested subtopic for that committee yeah. would be 
what we were just talking about, which is the, the date uh, driven thing, because if, if we're about to maybe lose zero to four, you know, people from the from our other towns, we right. might, and, and there's an opportunity to get them before they leave, we might want to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mr. Sansky. Apologies for being late. No, 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 no. It's, I, I'm not calling attention to your walking in. Uh, we've just drafted you to be on the Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee again. Okay. <laughs> Are you okay with that? Sure. Great. Right. Thank you. <laughs> So you'll be meeting soon, and uh, yes? I just wanted to check with the members of the subcommittee. Is it okay if I use Doodle Poll to try to schedule the guys? Although I know that's difficult for you, Mr. Sullivan. Um, I'll, I'll try. Okay. Great. So we just talked about literally the charge mm -hmm. we've gotten for members. Um, the four members are Mr. Sullivan, yourself, uh, Mr. Menino, and Ms. Spitzer. Fantastic. And the assistant superintendent uh, has um, offered to provide whatever counsel we, we seek um, to help us with the work we're doing. Okay. Which is deeply appreciated. Fantastic. Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, so advocacy efforts. Um, we talked about this is on the agenda because we talked about previously that um, uh, the obvious. I mean, there's, there's sort of two obvious. One is the question of what, what could happen to education policy that could affect us, negatively or positively. But then beyond that, we're just so dependent on state funds uh, for um, our budget and for the relief, any relief we can give to our member towns uh, in terms of their contributions for our budgets. And so um, it seemed, I think we've done advocacy before as a committee. But also, it just seems like this is something where we need to get organized. As I had mentioned before, and actually this is an opportune time, that um, if this committee wishes to organize itself to, I don't know, draft a letter or a statement with information and facts in it, that we could then pass and then submit, uh, you know, prepare and either submit as testimony. I know on March 22nd there's a, a hearing in the State House, um, or otherwise provide as advocacy. I think it would be worth also discussing with our colleagues on the Amherst Committee and on the uh, Pelham Committee at the very least, but also Schutzbury and Leverett would be great, um, to potentially do a collective advocacy around common points that we, we agree. And so this discussion is designed to elicit your ideas, input on how we might proceed with that. I think it's a desirable idea so that we can then assign tasks potentially to draft said letters or materials and then authorize myself to talk to the chair of the Amherst Committee. You're not the chair of the Pelham Committee anymore, but I'm looking towards you, towards, uh, towards uh, <laughs> other, the other members. So uh, do you have anything you want to talk uh, add, uh, Mr. Demling, in terms of what the substance of what's coming out of the pike? Or yeah. Um, so I, I, think, I think what what you said is accurate. I, th I think the, the theme this year that, that we're all operating in the backdrop of is um, – is a, is a higher level of anticipation that something's going to happen at the state level for the foundation budget change. I mean, so we passed a resolution here supporting that. Um, this is the MTA calls it the Fund, Fund Our Future campaign. Uh, it's the Promise Act, as Sonia Chang Diaz's bill, basically overhauling the foundation for it. And so it impacts districts that um, are typically larger and have less funds than we do, but it's, you know, is a key element of, of income inequality. Uh, so there's a lot of attention around that. Um, Different. Um, so we, uh, I attended a uh, a meeting with uh, local representatives, and so uh, talking with Joe and, and Mindy, and um, they were both of the opinion that uh, there is a lot of uh, anticipation that something will happen. Exactly what will happen is hard to say. Their feeling was that everything was on the table, quote unquote, which is good for us because even though the foundation budget, if fully implemented, would help us somewhat, there are other bigger buckets. So. Um, Actually, so before that meeting, I was talking to uh, Mr. Mangan a little bit about what are the biggest buckets that affect us because a lot of underfunded things. Mm -hmm. uh, and we sort of focused in on, uh, for our, our committee, uh, regional transportation. So last year, uh, because it wasn't fully funded, we lost out on $284,000. So that's one of the biggest buckets here. One of the other bigger buckets that's shared among all our committees for talking about what's a good focus for shared advocacy is the charter reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, the proposed change to that formula in the governor's H-70, which would drop our just this committee's anticipated um, 
reimbursement next year from 147,000 to zero. Um, and that's, that's an interesting one in terms of um, how we might be able to reach out and coordinate with other districts because it affects districts way beyond our region. Like for example, Boston would lose over $10 million. There's four or five cities that would lo lose over a million. There's like 50 cities that would lose over, it, they essentially cut the reimbursement um, pot in half. What was the rationale for the change? <laughs> well, I, I, will, I will resist the temptation to cut deeply into Secretary Pizer's terrible remarks on this, but essentially it's being promoted as a way to fully fund the reimbursement by cutting the level of the reimbursement to districts. Yeah, the ra the, what, they, what they said, what, yeah, that's basically it. what they said, <laughs> and they said this last year too, they didn't just say this this year, they've been trying for a couple of years, is they said, well, we can't fund fully fund charter reimbursement, um, so we need to really do that. <laughs> and since we can't afford to fund charter reimbursement, right. we're going to change the formula and front load the reimbursement on the first year, and uh, and and eliminate it in, in out years. Right. Uh, which is, um, it's technically true, but f f forgive my editorial, but it reminds me of w when welfare rolls declined precipitously. Um, a while ago, I mean, it's a couple decades ago, because we eliminated the eligibilities, we changed the eligibility substantially for welfare, and so by making people ineligible for it, we reduced the roles. Unemployment is similar. Huh? Unemployment also is similar. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. And so it's, like, it's, it's a perverse way to fully fund a line item is to reduce the cost of the line item. Yes. By changing eligibilities. I'm sorry. Go so ahead. no, so so that's exactly right. Uh, it it, get, it gets even worse actually for smaller districts. So you, there's an, another requirement that you have to be at your five at a five year maximum of charter school enrollment to get anything. So if you've gone from say four students to zero students to four students to zero students, and then you get four students, which we don't know until the budgets are all passed. All you know for a smaller district, uh, you know, so, so Pelham might be a good example. You could lose four percent of your budget yeah. out of the blue. Um, so, so yeah, so actually you mentioned the, the hearing, so I actually I'm, I'm planning to go to the hearing and uh, testify specifically to this um, and to, to call it out pretty directly about how it's been characterized. Um, and if, if my hope is that, um, you know, we should be able to get, generate some attention and work with some districts outside of our immediate region since it does affect other districts so much. Um, so that's, that's one possible area of focus. You know, regional transportation I think is a, is a, a bit more challenging, I think. Um, you know, we did a lot of advocacy last year, and you know, we didn't get uh, the traction that we wanted. Um, and it was, uh, and we have the the challenge this year of all the focus on the foundation budget. So I, I don't know to what degree. I think I think it may is a good example. You could sort of think of the two things together as it's great that we're doing the foundation budget. We totally support that and endorse that, but we can't forget these other pieces as well that affect other districts. It's, it's kind of a unifying theme, but it's a little hard to. Translate that into you know effective advocacy. I think I think I mean my my view of it would be I'd love to see, um, would be and we get we actually got a request from the four towns meeting, to say please include the four towns meeting the boards of select people, uh, and finance committees and stuff. So I actually think we should do that. And the funny thing is once you do that, it becomes much easier to explain explain the rationale for how these things fit together because they certainly fit together fiscally. But uh, Mr. Jones, you've been working a lot on this. I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, just a, a couple of points. I, I think, um, so we passed a resolution here in this body, but we also requested the Amherst Town Council to pass a resolution, which they did, mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, on behalf of, uh, well, against uh, sort of charter expansions and then also on behalf of the, the Promise uh, Act. Um, Senator Comerford has actually been advocating, I think, quite heavily around these issues and has requested that different, her constituent communities uh, send letters to her. She's willing to, if you can't make it to the hearing on the 22nd, she's collecting a lot of the uh, letters and information and we'll share them on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So that is always an option. Um, and I think beyond that, <clears throat> what we're hearing a lot coming from the other district representatives and other school committees is that <coughs> while people are expecting something to happen, they're also uh, feeling a little more pessimistic about mm -hmm. what that something could be. Um, and I think it's generally because the administration at the state level has not indicated any really, you know, uh, believable, I guess, um, change that, that is possible at the budget level. So uh, it, this really requires, I think, advocacy and engagement from our communities. It's not yeah. just our elected leaders that, you know, have to send letters and, and uh, you know, write to our elected representatives. 
uh, in, at the state level, it's also our communities that need to pull together and show up for these hearings and, you know, and have rallies and things like that because we have to send a very strong message to Boston that education matters and that our communities have been shortchanged for so long um, that it's impacting so many different areas of our communities, budgets, and what we can do in other places, not just in our schools. So uh, I think it's that ripple effect that I'm hoping people can turn on to and say this really matters and we want to do something about this, um, but it really will require sustained and heavy push, uh, much along the same lines of what Mr. Dumlings began our, our meeting tonight talking about with the Oakland teachers, yeah. uh, until you get those levels of turnout, you know, people aren't going to take us seriously. So. Ms. Reno. Are state revenues down due to the federal tax cut? State revenues are down right now, and they're running both. What they're <coughs> each to the beginning of the year, and when they're doing budgeting, they set levels of anticipated revenue um, by year, uh, each month rather, and um, which is called benchmark. And you can perform above or below benchmark or at benchmark. And um, through an earlier part of the fiscal, first half of the fiscal year, we were running ahead of benchmark actually for a number of months, and last two or three months, right? Yeah, January. Since January, yeah, we've been running below benchmark. Um, the reason for that, um, I don't know. I mean, I, the tax. Because some states are having problems because they're tied to the federal system. Yeah, that could, I mean, that could that could be some of it, but I don't I don't from what I was reading, I don't know that that's the okay. entire explanation. Okay. Interestingly enough, and this could be you know, unrelated, but um, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics released um, a, a revision to our state's employment numbers for the for 2018. And it's a bench, it's called, it's a re-benchmarking process, what they do every year, where they get um, the first half of um, the quarterly census of employment and wages data. And so it's something that happens every February. Uh, and it often changes the employment numbers, but last year, we had reported, the state had reported that it had gained around 70, little under 70,000 jobs. And with the re-benchmarking that was released last week, um, it was revised downward to only 20,000 jobs gained. So it means there's something happening also in our economy that, I mean, some people speculate it's because we're actually maxed out and our unemployment rate's too low and it's hard to find people to employ. But whatever the, whatever the reasoning is, um, I was talking to an economist today about that who was telling me that, he has no idea. <laughs> and he knows a hell of a lot more than I do. So I'm going to, but I mean, the bottom line is our, our state revenues are down, which also does mean, in fact, when you're looking ahead to budgeting for the next fiscal year, they're gonna, you're going to start out in a more cautious or conservative place. And unfortunately, despite, um, what's the tax that's going to be being promoted? I'm trying, to some, I'm trying to remember the tax that's being promoted. I think it's like an additional real estate transfer tax that's going to do climate change uh, adaptation. Um, beyond that, um, the Baker administration is still essentially in a no-new taxes yeah. sort of mindset. It, it, it's even worse. So la last year, the economy was supposedly as good as it's been. Yeah. The governor, so, you know, so we undercut regional transportation by 25 percent. Know, like I said, the, our district lost 284,000 just because of that. You know, you, and we, we all remember the painful cuts last year. And then he calls it a surplus, <laughs> right? So it's. It, it, even even if all of a sudden revenues start coming in, great. It's not going to fundamentally change the mentality of of the governorship. Plus, plus there's there's another problem that also has, has to be called out, and then I'll stop talking about politics. But you know, the House of Representatives for a long time has had a real difficult time getting new ideas and and progressive change from from its base. You know, it's it's become pretty stagnant in terms of its leader leadership and uh, and and movement on that. And it's been it's been, it's been hard to to get progressive voices, you know, heard. And so I think what Mr. Donia says is exactly right, is it's going to take some level of a sea of red t-shirts, you know, of flooding the, the state house, you know, some week or month from now that like kind of, you know, shocks the the system into into a, a recalibration because, you know, it's, it's, it is about revenue. You know, there's going to be, have to be some sort of revenue change at the state level for any of this to really move. In significant yes, I, mean, I do think though that, I mean, the good news is I think what you'd want to have is you'd want to have people like Representative Dom, um, Senator Comerford, mm -hmm. um, Representative mm -hmm. Blay, um, who are who rep who represent our towns, cover our towns, um, who I think are, are who understand the issues, they get it, they're they're in our corner fighting for this. And I think so. I think you know the nice news is it, it would 
it might be more emotionally satisfying to be in a district by people who were not on our side where we could go rally and occupy their offices. But here, I think what we should be doing, as you're suggesting, is strategize with them and try to figure out what's the most effective way we can give them the ammunition they need. So what I'd love to do is I'd love to um, re-delegate this topic um, to Mr. Donius and Mr. Demling. And if there's anyone else who wants to be involved, as long as we don't have three more people, because that would give us five, which gives us five. I suppose you could always post it as a meeting. But are you up for it? Yeah. Fight the power. Cool. <laughs> and and, and my, my thinking is that we should, tail. my thinking is that we should probably have some kind of a letter analogous to what was done for PVCICS, um, only on this topic of the budget. Um, something that we could approve as a committee and that we could submit um, officially and potentially even share with our colleagues at Amherst. Uh, as well as also Pelham and Leverett and Shrewsbury. Yes. Pelham, um, we are submitting a letter um, to Senator Comerford and Representative Dom about the charter reimbursement that's already been drafted okay. and probably being sent out, maybe already sent out now. So. Great. Um, I was just going to try to tread carefully on where our lines are, but. Um, there are a lot of um, community members um, in Leverett um, and I'm sure in other towns that would like an opportunity to uh, help our statement. So if, um, I don't know if it's appropriate, but if there's a letter that we could share with the public and encourage them as well to modify it to their particular um, experience and encourage them to also reach out, um, I think just more voices is better. I know. We have to be careful. We can't be advocating for things. But. So we have two. We have two then things. Then one letter for us to approve and send off, and then another thing that would be like a skinny down fact sheet yeah. to the go into people's letters that they might choose to send out on their own yeah. behalf. And then I think the other thing is if um, if either one of you are in touch with um, Max Page, mm -hmm. um, find out what the MTA is up to and doing. Um, it seems to me we could do some, some sort of a teaching um, with the four towns, with the four select boards, there's three select boards in town council, finance committees, and school committees, and then invite the public in and do some, we could do an event in other words, mm -hmm. to kick, to demonstrate and kick off our advocacy um, and obviously invite the center and represent, representatives to it. So one idea, uh, I had reached out to one of our uh, colleagues across the river there in Northampton, school mm -hmm. committee member, who has worked with us previously on another related issue, advocacy related issue. Um, and she's actually organizing a, uh, a write-in uh, event where, you know, inviting community members to write letters to their state elected re leaders mm -hmm. uh, expressing their concerns. And that seems like a perfect thing to do, and, you know, it's, it's low, kind of what I like to call low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, because it's basically just inviting people to a uh, you know, community place. It can be the Banks Community Center, it can be some other local meeting place, and uh, having a, a template that you share with them and then inviting them to go ahead and fill that out and write it. You know, And it seems like something that a lot of people could probably find a half hour, an hour to do, yeah. um, and you know, shows some of the support that, that we're talking about from the community. So we could look to things like that also if the sure. community's interested in that. But I mean, I, I, if you're if you're if you're willing, I think I'd, I would reach out to the MTA and see what they're up to, see if we can organize something together with them. So speaking of the MTA, so they are uh, they have a bus going to the hearing on the 22nd yes. that is open to the MTA and all their allies. Uh, so if if you are so moved and the public is so moved, uh, that is leaving from um, that is leaving from. Well, I'll get it in a second. Anyways, <laughs> they have uh, uh, Sheldon Field in Northampton, 7 o'clock in the morning. And it'll be back at 3, and they give you lunch. So, <laughs> so if you really want to get into it. Um, and that J Jackson School, uh, the writing campaign organized in Northampton is at the Jackson School on Monday, the 18th. That's open to everybody, uh, even if you're not from Northampton, 7 to 9. But that's a good idea. And it actually reminded me of a, of a so I, I was asking uh, Joe Comerford, like, so tactically, what is the thing? Because, like you said, we know that, Mindy and Natalie and Joe, they all get it. And yeah. so it's not about beating their door down. But, and so she, she suggested, you know, in addition to showing up at key points, 
that you know, letter writing to the local paper to get it um, more public awareness, not just from us but from the public, but also to the uh, to the Senate President, to the um, to the House Speaker, and to the Governor. Like you might not think that people that high up are going to listen to you, but that that volume of response does matter. So uh, those are a couple of suggestions that she had. Turn to me, Alyssa Brewer has. Um, you remember what her position is at MMA, Mass Municipal Association? Mm -hmm. She has like a. She got her. She has an elite perch at the Mass Municipal Association. Um, you remember what it is? I want to say it's something with the foundation of you. Yeah, it's right in the heart of this work, and I think that we should also reach out to her because um, the honestly, I I know people love their schools, um, and we want to fight for our schools. If you want to grab people where they live, uh, go out, go to their property taxes and their their town budgets. And the fact that we're under a lot of pain, and a lot of our communities under pain, including ones that aren't necessarily the Brocktons of the world that desperately need Chapter 70 revision, um, that is where you want to you want to get people to move on on transportation funding and try and, and hold the line on charter reimbursement. Make it a fiscal issue. Make it and get which means MMA, town councils, select boards. Um, by the way, I, I haven't been filibustering or intending to. But our next item was scheduled originally for 7.30, uh, and Mr. Zomik isn't here yet. So I think what I'd like to do is if we're ready to move on, and you folks feel like you have mm -hmm. enough feedback from the committee, mm -hmm. great. Uh, then, you're welcome. Then, thank you. Uh, then what I'd like to do is move up uh, items D, E, and F until um, Mr. Zomik arrives. You okay with that? He might have to go home early. I don't know if he'd, he'd like that. Well, the only thing I, this is up to you. D and F might take a little longer, just because it's the, all the votes and the reading. It, it might be easier to do G, H, and I, if that's. Are those all you? You're not, those getting, are all you're not me dodging as well. anything. No, right? no, no, those are all me. As well. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I will, I will defer to your suggestion. Okay. So we're gonna go with G, H, and I. Okay. So the first one, G. Um, so all three of these. Our, our potential votes for tonight, if you don't want to vote tonight, you can vote at the next meeting. Um, they're mostly pretty standard or sort of procedural. So G is approval of stabilization expenditures. Yes. So every year we have to, uh, the school committee has to approve the disbursement from the stabilization fund. Right now there are two disbursements there. We pay the interest on our bond anticipation notes, which fund our capital projects. And we have a debt schedule for some of the academy renovations that happened about seven or eight years ago. It's almost done. Um, so the two disbursements are listed there. Um, they include the beginning balance, the earnings, and so what the ending balance would be um, for your information. And if you feel comfortable voting tonight, the motion's below. You want to walk us through? Yep. So um, essentially the motion would be to approve the disbursements for FY19 uh, from the Capital Stabilization Fund as shown above. Uh, and again, once the Stabilization Academy debt is done, which I think is in two or three years, then really the only thing that will come out of there is ban interest. Okay, great. Is there this? I was just going to read the motion. Please. I move to approve the FY19 disbursements from the Capital <coughs> Stabilization Fund as shown above. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion or questions from Mr. Mangana? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read, signified by raising hand. It carries unanimously. Nine to nothing. Keep the streak going, Mr. McDonough. So the next one is uh, designer selection procedures. So these every regional school district town are supposed to have designer selection procedures formally adopted. I would venture to guess that most don't have a record of that, or many don't have a record of that, and we are one of them that we do not have a record of that. Um, so the state has a template that they put online of sort of best practices around this. Um, this is what we've typically followed in the past anyway. Um, but what I'd like to do is to put this to rest going forward is to have a formal adoption of these sort of best practices around designer selection procedures. Um, and again, so it essentially outlines you know, we advertise, we put together a document, we advertise it, we solicit responses from designers, we use a qualification-based evaluation process to rank them, then we look at pricing and then make a decision whether we want to go to the top ranked. Um, and all of that. So basically everything we've done in the past to select designers. Um, but this is basically word for word um, from the department or the division of designer selection board. Sorry, I was trying to think of an acronym, DSB. Um, from the designer selection board um, from the state of Massachusetts. Okay, are there any questions about this item? Have we talked 
with regard to number eight, have we talked about trying to adjust it so it didn't require three at some point? Or? We did, and that was sort of really the, the main impetus for doing this, was we were trying to get it down to maybe two because we've had a hard time in the past getting three. Um, but unfortunately, when I worked with the state on reviewing this, um, three is required by statute, so we cannot go down to two. Well, that's an easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are there other questions or comments? So, Dennis? So, just one. Uh, in Section 4, it mentions the central register published by the Secretary of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I was wondering if this is a place where we want to perhaps mention the local paper here, mm -hmm. or is this. Uh, it was unclear to me if this is just the requirement by statute as well, yes. or if there was room for additional outlets. So it's both, actually. So the first okay. piece is um, advertising the newspaper of general circulation. Yeah, um, the locality. Yeah, yeah. So that we typically will go with either the Gazette or the um, Republican if it's a, sort of a bigger project and we want a wider arc. Um, and then the Central Register, yeah, it's just a... It's required It's a required. Well. It's a literal forum that you kind of post details about it and it goes out to all the everyone who signed up for it, essentially. Okay. And this appears in the section of the newspaper nobody reads. I read it because I have to cut it out from my folder. So. <laughs> <laughs> Right, many Apparently, you're not bidding on a lot of projects around here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. Are there other questions? Yes, Ms. Bitzer. So, as a, as a member of the policy subcommittee, yes. I'm just trying to clarify is this a, because it's a procedure, not something that would go through the policy subcommittee, or is it also would, would this? Go, I'm just curious about the, yeah. the distinction and if there is one. I think it is a tough one. I think it, it's not technically a policy. Um, I think it is kind of falls under the procedure. I mean, it could go to policy subcommittee. I actually brought it to the, I think, budget and finance subcommittee first. I think we looked yeah. at it there because it didn't seem like it was quite a policy. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah so, so I haven't treated it as a policy, but I could see if you wanted to treat it that way, you could. There's not a ton of um, discretion over many of the yeah. areas in here um, that are required by statute. I just wanted to bring it up to the committee as well. I had actually, I thought the same. I was actually. I forgot, but I was actually curious when I first read this. I was like, huh, should this go through the policy committee? Yeah, you were at that meeting when you first looked at this. So <laughs> I was at that meeting? I think so. <laughs> at the, on the budget and finance. Yes. Really? I think you raised. It was over in the corner. That was fascinating. <laughs> Did I ask the same question then? It was like three months. God, I'm so consistent. <laughs> um, and this is a longer document, so if you don't. Okay, thank God these things are all tonight, recorded, right? That's fine. It's like embarrassing. It's a reference. Comments on my part. Uh, are there, are, I, mean, it's, I guess the question would be whether we feel comfortable. Uh, voting it, or we want it for the review. And I, is there, is there, uh, what's the timing on this item? Um, there's not a super rush. I'd like to have it in, in place before, you know, if and when, if we get approved by the MSBA process, uh, moving forward with the roof. Okay. Um, but that probably won't be till summer. So I think if we can do it in the next month or two, that'll be fine. Okay. Is it nice? Um, so my preference, I think, would be to come back sure. and vote this later. But yeah. I just wanted to ask um, if the town, if the towns, multiple towns, would be also doing something similar, or is this only for the the school committee? Uh, you know, I'm just trying to, uh, since we tend to yeah. have so many joint projects, right. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're kind of in, in yeah. sync with each other. So this one specifically for the region, but theoretically, if the town doesn't have one, they should be doing a similar thing. Okay, and they will be following a similar template. Yeah, there wouldn't be, this This isn't um, specific to regions, so this, this template would apply to towns or regions. Okay. So uh, why don't we refer this to the policy subcommittee for your review, and you can look at it and set it back up. Make sense? Okay. Great, then I'll see that is done by acclimation. And the last one's pretty quick, if you want to, well, I hope, I think it's pretty quick. Um, so the last one is extension of the transportation contract. So this um, FY20 will be the last year of our transportation contract that started in FY16. Um, it's an option year, so therefore you have to sort of vote each option year as it comes up. Um, so this spring and summer, we would start our work on preparing the bid package for the next f f a three to five year contract. Um, but this would basically just be put into place the last year of the contract with Cosmescus and Five Star. Okay. So we did this once last year, right? We carried it forward. Yeah, and last then, year was the so first option. So now we're going to get ready to. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so each contract, yeah. the way we've typically, typically done it is a three year base contract with two option years. Yeah. So this would be the second. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Ms. Um, 
Can you explain the CPI adjustment and why it's going up 2.5% this year? Because inflation is going That's up. That's what it is? Yeah, oh, so okay. we've benefited from that in the past. When um, CPI has gone down, you can see there have been some rate reductions, which are pretty unusual. Um, I was just hopeful. Yeah. That's the only <laughs> that's the only cost escalator in the contract, so we don't have some contracts, and, and we're actually going to bring in <coughs> an outside person, I think, to help us craft our next bid package because it's getting so specialized. Um, some contracts have, like, fuel escalators and things like that. We don't. We just have a total overall um, CPI increase. So, um, so yeah, it's going up because that's when inflation went up. Okay. Uh, I'd entertain a motion if there were one forthcoming. I'll move to approve the extension of the transportation contract with Five Star and Kismaskis for is there FY20. A, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this item? Questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. Uh, Thank you. Nine to nothing. Thank you very much. We'll see you again shortly. Uh, oh, if you can break, you're doing that? Yeah, I'll do it. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next item on our the regular, uh, back to the regular schedule of the agenda, is the, the region and town of Amherst's athletic field study. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there's any introduction we would offer to this other than to say this is an item that's not um, new to the committee. The committee may remember we'd gotten a lengthy presentation on this before, um, but it's if you remember the discussion, it's pretty significant both in terms of the needs and conditions of our fields as well as also some of the visioning that's gone into the opportunity to rethink how we're um, providing accessibility to our fields as well as also the quality of, of multiple different uh, recreational um, and competitive options on these fields. So uh, I don't know if you had any introduction, otherwise I'll be happy to ask Mr. Zomek to come forward. And welcome. Sure, thank you very much, Dave Zomek, Assistant Town Manager. Um, happy to be here tonight. I know we have spoken about this project at some length, so uh, Dr. Morris and Mr. Mangano had asked me to just come in for a brief uh, update and uh, Q&A if you had any questions, uh, uh, either one of us would be happy to answer those. Um, as you know, the Rec Working Group has been uh, coming together for over a year and a half looking at the fields in our downtown, specifically focused on the fields around the high school, community field, and the middle school. And out of that work uh, came this wonderful report by Weston and Sampson. Um, I notice that this is actually uh, dated May 8th, uh, 2018. Uh, I had a conference call with Weston and Sampson today. You may recall that we were hoping to finish up the written report to get it to you and uh, our now town council uh, in January. There's been a couple of delays. There's been some back and forth finishing up that contract. But uh, I'm assured today by the team at Weston and Sampson that they will have that by April 1st. So we will have, we have these wonderful uh, uh, images that uh, Mr. Mangano and I were hoping to just buzz through. There's just five or six of them, sure. just to refresh your memory, uh, memories. Um, but that written report with the images should provide uh, a basis for us moving forward. And as we've said all along, uh, this was a, uh, a planning process. And uh, we think the first that's gone on in a long time looking at the fields, their condition, and how we move forward. Um, happy to buzz through. Uh, this gives just kind of a project timeline. Uh, the rec working group was made up by uh, a broad uh, uh, array of people representing recreational interests. Uh, of course, uh, you all were represented. Uh, Mr. Sullivan joined us uh, for this process as well. Mr. Mangano uh, was there for many of the meetings. And we really pulled together experts to take a look with Weston and Sampson at the condition of our field, the usage of our fields, and how we could come up with a plan for the future that would be more efficient, more cost effective, and better serve our student athletes and the community. Uh, conditions are not great. Uh, we've invested in some areas, but not in others. Uh, as Mr. Nakajima indicated, uh, one of the areas that we focused on a lot uh, really was accessibility. And we found that uh, most of our fields, our facilities, are not accessible to uh, the standard that we would all like them to be. Uh, many of them are old. Uh, many of them uh, create obstacles for people uh, of all abilities. The key issue, whoops. The key issue, as you all know, is the condition of the track. So we, we spent a lot of time focused on that. And we came up with a plan that, um, let's see our next slide, 
this was, as you recall, about a 30-slide presentation that we yeah. just plucked <laughs> out, um, three or four or five. So this is the um, option one or the preferred option, uh, which indicates putting the track and a multi-purpose field just to the west of the high school, of the building we're in now. Um, and we, uh, I'm not going to go into phases, but we were very conscious, obviously, of the, the many capital projects that are out there and the demands on uh, um, uh, our budgets. So we phased this, and there could be as many as five phases, but we were keyed into the fact that the track is in very poor condition, uh, and we believe that phase one would focus on a track and a multi-purpose field uh, surface yet to be determined, but I will say there is a strong leaning on the group toward a synthetic uh, surface. There are lots and lots of advantages to a synthetic surface uh, and the efficiencies that that can bring. What so, will happen to the old track? Uh, the old track uh, will be retired <laughs> and uh, removed. Removed, okay. yes. You can see in this image uh, I don't have a pointer, but the, the old track uh, is kind of uh, where the a, a new softball eventually would be. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mangana or <laughs> whoever has the that. Old track. That's right what I was about. Okay. Now, it was once new. <laughs> this, this image before you shows a number of different improvements, but again, we're mainly focused on the track and a multi-purpose field uh, to address the urgent need okay. of a new track mm -hmm. uh, and the ADA uh, improvements that this would, would bring. And um, in this report that will come out in early April, uh, it will talk about the efficiencies that can be achieved through a synthetic field. Number of months uh, that you can play on that field, practice on that field, and we can get out of this cycle of fields like the current field in the middle of the track that can't be used much of the year because it's either too dry or too wet mm -hmm. or too hard or unsafe. I guess the state of the art for current artificial playing surfaces is that um, we're able to minimize uh, any injuries associated with. I mean, I know that. I mean, I, I think I've read, being an avid sports fan <laughs> over the years, that there's there's like a variety of surfaces, and some over the years have lent themselves to torquing people's knees and a little bit more, or just being you know put more pounding on an individual, and I think these days you have services that are significantly more advanced. Sure, the well, to provide comfort and safety. It, it makes me think a little bit about, uh, about a new computer or a new phone. Yeah. You never really want to be buying the newest of the new because yeah. they need to get the bugs out. So we're certainly behind the times in terms of synthetic fields. Lots and lots of uh, communities, as you know, all over Massachusetts, all right. over New, new England have gone with them. So. We're not, uh, we're not uh, breaking any new ground here, if you will. So there, there are many new improvements in fields, both uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, in terms of knees and yeah. ankles, uh, and playability. Um, many of the new fields uh, are better uh, when it comes to how many seasons you can play on them. Some of the colleges actually play 12 months of year. They clear the snow and they play 12 months a year on those fields or practice. Um, so. They've come a long way, and by being a little bit late to this improvement, uh, I think we'll benefit from all that research and all those uh, different uh, techniques that have come before us. Um, I, I don't want to continue, but please. Yeah. Sorry, I, you mentioned the ADA improvements, accessibility improvements. Um, I don't know if you could just spend a couple of minutes talking about, um, I know our current fields are pretty much inaccessible, um, but what sort of features are being added? Yes, yeah, so um, this plan, uh, when, 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 it, when the entire written uh, plan is out with the images, will include ADA improvements for all the fields. So the current varsity baseball field, uh, the practice field. So we kind of think of this as two different areas. There's the region on the north and then community field, which is town owned on the southern part. Uh, of the street there. Um, uh, so we have designed things to have ADA improvements for all of those facilities. On the region side, in the first phase, which would be around the track and the, uh, and the, um, the, the inside field, the multipurpose field, you can see a light, maybe Mr. Mangano can point to it, but a light tan color around the entire outside would be uh, ADA surfaces for uh, uh, spectators, parents, uh, athletes, uh, anyone could come and access those from the high school 
or from Mattoon Street or from their vehicle when they get out of the car at the parking area. Um, of course, the, the inner workings of the field, the uh, areas where coaches, where uh, spectators would all be ADA, um, all meet ADA standard. And likewise, in the plan in the different phases, you can see that path is continued around and uh, provides access to all of the different fields. So every one of the fields, as we move through the, the stages over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, the, the new uh, women's softball field would be accessible, of course, the practice fields as well. So all of them would meet current ADA standards. Any other questions? What is the projected budget for phase one? I, I may defer to Mr. Mangano. Uh, we have a range. I will say we have a range. In the report, we were asked uh, in previous meetings to kind of narrow that. So that will be narrowed some. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mangano. Um, we want it to be conservative. So the number is high in phase one to be conservative. We're hoping to be able to, to bring that number down some. Dave, correct me if I'm off trying to remember these numbers, but um, so the first phase, which would be basically the track um, and the field and maybe some leveling would be four to six million. Um, the range somewhat depends on whether you go with synthetic versus natural um, and some of the other features, but I believe the range is four to six for phase one. Yeah, I, go, go ahead, it was a little lower. I think it's lower to get the field and the track, but the farther we go around that, right. obviously the cost sure. And, and we also asked what would be the cost if we didn't do any of this, if we just replaced the, the track and field where it is, essentially. Um, and my recollection of that cost was around 2 to $3 million. again, depending on how far down you have to dig to fix everything. And just to replace the track and the inside field would be 2 to $3 million in the current location. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, is there demoing them as a guys? Um, so thank you for bringing this back to us again. Um, I look forward to the report coming out and then having what I assume is going to be a conversation between our committee and the town about, about how to fund this going forward. Um, just, just a couple of comments. I think I, I love all the information that's presented and the process seems really great. And I, I love like the pretty pictures of like, how it kind of look. Um, I, I, think, I think in terms of presenting this to the public and, and the town council, um, it's important to not pull any punches about how dire the situation really is at times with the track and the fields. Like I, I think we, we had a... Um, uh, high school playoff game that we couldn't host last fall. Is that right? Right, because yeah. because the field. And you know, I've I've seen I've been out there uh, for some of the teams practicing in the in the spring, and it's 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 rock hard. You know, so the 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 injury level, the fact that they literally are not usable for 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 you know, and the, that percentage of time is increasing. Just just sort of underscore the urgency. And it's it's not something something you have to oversell in a rhetorical way, but I th I think just maybe there's the natural human. You know, tendency when you're presenting something new is to is to you want it to be positive because you want everybody to feel good about it. But there really is an urgency that that when I've had individual conversations with members of the public and town council, um, it takes a little while before they say, "Wait, I thought this was just kind of like a nice to have." Like, no, there actually is, you know, big uses. Um, the other point is um, that if we if we do none of this, what would we have to be doing instead? Like, I, and so I think you had just answered my question right before about. Um, you know, the, there would be a capital request coming quite soon in order to just get up to minimum safety and use standards. So I, th I think those two points together, you know, understanding that there are also, also you know, many other town capital needs that the council and the, our committee is going to have to uh, wrestle with in the coming years um, are, are important to, to provide context. Is it nice? Oh, please. I didn't know there was a question. I just wanted to thank Mr. Demling for those, those comments. Um, I think, yeah, I don't want to speak for Mr. Mangano, but yes, I think we are, we have been focused on bringing you a plan. Uh, Mr. Farrow is not here tonight as our AD, but I think there, there was a meeting or two here where some athletes came in, some coaches came in, and I think as we move forward in this process, I would hope that we would invite a broader conversation where we need to hear those voices. Uh, I tend to be focused on on the nuts and bolts and where we are and where we think we want to go. But I think we do need to bring in those other voices uh, who represent all the sports teams that can or can't use this and um, some of the issues that they're facing from injuries and, and uh, lack of, of play. So uh, absolutely. I think um, 
the other piece we talked about is once we have the report coming back to you and then um, understanding how we go out to the other communities to talk with them about this. And in addition, it would be incumbent upon us to come up with a funding plan. Uh, um, and we talked about private fundraising as well coming into this. So we're working on that behind the scenes. This was just an update. But we, we, have, uh, we know what we need to do to bring it back to you at the appropriate time, and, and we'll work with you on when we bring it to the town council. So, right. Right. Is it nice? So uh, I agree with Mr. Dumbling. I think that you know, uh, clearly stating for the communities, the different towns, the uh, impact on students and athletes, um, and also just the, you know, the, the families and caregivers who come to, to a lot of the games and everything is extremely important. I would say, you know, I was reading something recently about uh, high school, the, the, the number of ACL injuries, which are, you know, sort of the ligaments connecting the knees, uh, has increased quite, you know, dramatically actually in recent years. Um, and of course, I think you don't want to have children that are crippled <laughs> as a result of playing sports, right, when it's supposed to be benefiting their education and benefiting their, their well-being and all of that. So I'm not in any way stating that our fields would be responsible for anyone being uh, severely injured or anything like that, um, but it is something to consider and, you know, and to factor in. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, if you can remind the committee what the Weston, what Weston Sampson's formal role would be in this process uh, beyond the study that they're, they're delivering in, on April 1st. Uh, and then also, you mentioned looking to other sources for aid or for you know for funding. Uh, have we? Is there? Is it possible to get state aid for anything like this? You know. So I don't think West. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think West and Sampson necessarily has any formal role after this, unless they want to. You know, if the unless the town decides they want to do this project, West and Sampson potentially could help us and say help divide, uh, create this. Um, but I think once the formal report's done, essentially their contract is over um, at that point. Um, and you. then <coughs> your second question was about... Uh, if there's any state aid or there, other... Yeah. So there's not that I know of on a school, like, like an MSBA version. Um, there are some like individual sport type things that you might be able to get some smaller grants. Um, we've also looked at, from the town perspective, there's some larger grants, but we don't... As of right now, this, this wouldn't qualify because it's on regional school land. If it was on town land, it might qualify differently. Um, is it the community block grant or the, the fields grant? That um, there is, we're also looking at uh, potentially CPA dollars. Yeah, we've also the looked. The legality of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, since all four towns, all four member towns have accepted the CPA, mm -hmm. so there's the potential that CPA funds could be used by the towns to pay their debt service for parts of the project. There's, there's some things that are specifically excluded, but um, that would create more flexibility for the towns. So, so we're at that point now where we're trying to line up as many different funding, possible funding sources as possible since it is such an expensive project. Thank you. Great. Are there, are there other, Ms. Uh, Kasson? I thought just a quick question about um, the, the difference between turf and a, a natural grass field. Would there, would there be savings in terms of maintenance over the years if we had an artificial field? The report that, that is going to be put together will have that information. I'm not, I don't think either one of us are an expert in that that uh, area but our understanding is yes there would be um, but they have to factor in also the life of a of a turf field i believe it's around 20 years um, depending on how it's maintained but yes uh, it doesn't need to be fertilized it doesn't need to be limed it doesn't need to be mowed all of those things that you see both um, uh, school staff and dpw staff out there doing every year uh, you know, nine months of the year would not need to be done on this field. Um, but there are some other maintenance issues like removal of snow. There's different um, synthetic uh, 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 turf that either should or doesn't have to be uh, snow blown to, to get the snow off because it does pack it down. So there's different costs that way. So there would be some savings. It's I don't think that's going to be kind of an earth-shattering number. I think... <coughs> The more important number, uh, the more important analysis is how many games, how many practices can we have on that new field that won't rely on fields all over town that we are maintaining with mowing, with um, uh, lime, fertilizer, grass seed. And also as we look at our sustainability profile, uh, frankly, all of those are carbon-based. Uh, you know, lawn mowers and lawn equipment are really 
uh, very highly polluting um, machinery. So if we can cut down on the amount of uh, grass that we're mowing every week, week in, week out at all of these fields, it would be good for our, uh, you know, for our overall uh, uh, sustainability profile. So, Ms. Spear? The Amherst College playing fields on Route 9 are green a couple days after a snowfall. How do they do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, if, if I'm thinking of the ones on the way to Hadley, they're turf. They're artificial turf. I'm but sorry. the, the snow right. just evaporates? No, no, no. It's they remove the snow. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Could I, one other comment I would make uh, as we develop the, the, the kind of funding uh, plan for this, both public and private, um, there is also a potential for revenue generating on these fields. Many communities host tournaments. And that definitely needs to be, I hope, part of our uh, plan for these fields. Uh, there's quite a bit of revenue to be gained uh, by hosting, whether it's an ultimate tournament, a soccer tournament, a lacrosse tournament, and the list goes on. So uh, lots of communities do that, and it's a way to offset some of the short and long-term costs. So when's, when's the, uh, when would the next time you'd come forward to us with the, the plan? Or? Um, if we have the plan on April 1st, I'd like a week or so to review it with Mr. Mangano and other staff, and we could be here whenever you would like us to be here with some more definitive, a definitive timeline and some of the other, uh, answering some of the other questions you've had um, later in April or? Yeah. I think that'd be, I think that'd be great to do. We'll, we'll figure it out the exact meeting, but if that's the yeah. general window, just ask you. Um, just another question um, I think that would be helpful to prepare an answer for. Um, there are some uh, members in my community that I've heard from um, that, uh, given our financial states of our town, struggle with spending a, this sort of large sum of money on what they really feel is a nice to have. They didn't have fields like this when they went to school here. Uh, they utilized the Amherst College track when they were in school here, right? Isn't there other um, fields that could be used to support these that are already being paid for by UMass or Amherst College or things like that? And so I don't expect you to have an answer for that, but I, it's a criticism I hear often. Um, and for one, I don't have, I have lots of nice answers like, well, but our students need fields and need to have access to fields at the times that they need them and not at the whim of the college, but um, just to kind of maybe put a formalized piece around that a little bit to say how, you know, the colleges are very generous to us, but they have priority on their fields, um, and what does that really mean? So I think those are great comments, and, and we are anticipating those, and I think it's incumbent upon us to go back and particularly work with um, with the athletic director to answer and some of the coaches to answer some of those questions because we've heard them as well. Okay. Is this a nice to have? Is this, you know, the Ferrari of plans? No, it is not. Many communities yeah. throughout Western Mass and Eastern Mass have fields like this or are building them now. And I think there's a lot of lessons learned that we can bring from those other communities uh, because they've made the decision to go in this in this direction because of uh, efficiencies because of playability, uh, because of costs over time, that we can't maintain all these fields all over town um, uh, and continue to pay for them. So uh, I've learned something through this whole study. Uh, when I started this a year and a half, two years ago, even before that, I was of the mind that we should be spending lots of money to improve Groff Park, to in, uh, improve Kiwanis Park on Stanley Street. And I'm not set on this opinion yet, but I, I'm quite sure now that I don't believe that's the way to go. I think we need to invest in, Weston and Sampson has shown us that with an investment in these fields, a community field in the high school and some at the middle school, those other fields can become informal play areas. We don't need to spend half a million dollars on irrigation or, um, or leveling of the Kiwanis field. I don't know if any of you have children who played there. My, both my children played soccer there and it was a dust bowl. But I don't think it's a good investment any longer to spend a lot of money out there. Um, it will, it, if we do it right here, I don't think we'll need those this, fields. This is the top, um, please, Big Tom. Uh, just building on, on that, and I, it's something that you had said talking about the potential revenue opportunities, and, and I think sometimes um, what can help beyond having the stories from the teams, the, the coaches and the, and the athletes themselves is actually to quantify 
what the usage of the fields today and potential, right? So, because I think when you look at it and look at the number of individual, the athletes, the number of hours that these fields are getting used, it, you will see that there, there's very little room for us to sort of farm it out to other fields around because Amherst College uses their, their fields and facilities probably to the max as well. And it, not just our schools, but then also who else is using the fields today. So the youth sports, um, youth teams in, in Amherst and, and the region are using, are using these fields as well. So I think quantifying that can really help drive that home too. If, if, you're, will, if you're willing to uh, do it, when you're sort of organizing yourselves to put together um, your presentations or talk about how you're going to do outreach, um, I, would, I would welcome it. If, I mean, if you have any interest in re reaching out to the school committee again and seeing if they're members of the committee who might be willing to provide some uh, advice, you know, just help provide some advice on how to approach this discussion. Because uh, it, it's, I mean, w one, I've been horrified by the conditions we have, uh, really on the track in that area, associated area. I mean, it's really dangerous, actually, for kids. I know you're doing your best job, so I don't want to, we're coming into track season, so I don't want to, but it's mean, but it, it, the conditions are really very poor. Um, and it's been demonstrated by cancellations, things like that. Um, you know, from a high school perspective, I'm absolutely ancient. I'm like, I'm really ancient, I'm really old. And, and the current, and the current um, track and its soccer field inside was done either when I was in high school or slightly like right before I was in high school or something like that. No, the, the, that track I didn't run on, so it's like 20-ish. Years old. No, there was there was a no yes, there was a track mid nineteen nineties I think was that. Well, there was a there was an earlier reorient there was an earlier the cinder reorganization track. of the track yes. that created moved it to meters as opposed to yards. Yep. And and did the soccer field inside. That's two tracks it was ago. That was two tracks ago. <laughs> That's ancient. ancient <laughs> but the, the the point I was going to get at is that I know I'm old. I started off old. No, the point I was going to get at, though, is that, uh, well, it's funny, I wasn't even thinking about the, the surfacing. I mean, believe, there, was a, there was an earlier organization before then, and sort of, I, I think of this as being more like the contemporary organization, where they moved to the metric system, which is a great thing if you're running track. And uh, I don't know, I honest, I get it, but I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, this is, this is a, these are terrible fields, they're in awful condition. And uh, it also is kind of dumb to have them running east-west um, when you're looking at sunsets and sunrises and everything. And it needs to be upgraded. I mean, I don't actually, and they're completely unaccessible. The, unac the unaccessible piece to me is really I mean, um, it's horrifying. very important. And it's, it's, I mean, it's not just a matter of parents and, uh, and, and community members. It's also the athletes themselves. I mean, we just had a discussion earlier about um, Special Olympics and and the idea that we don't have facilities that enable the full participation of uh, the students and people living in, in our district is horrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's important and it, is, it does need to be a priority. The point is, we need to help you. If I could just circle back to the um, your comments about um, quantifying. So the good news is we have all that data. We can actually show how many student athletes are using all these fields, what seasons, so that's all part of the report. And that was something we talked about yeah. very early on with the rec working group. Um, the athletic director, uh, some LSSC staff all worked on that and, and pulled that together. So that will be part of the Weston and Samson. I think that tells a very important story that if you don't have a child involved in sports, or even if you do, you have no idea, Real, I didn't, until I looked at some of the data how much these fields are programmed throughout the year, and then where those, where those, uh, those dead zones are when we can't use the fields. Uh, Rich Farrow tells a story about the soccer team not getting out there, I think, in 2018. Granted, it was a very wet year, but uh, we didn't use that track, the, the field in the middle of the track much at all during 2018. Hmm. One or two times. That's unbelievable There's to me. bound to be a couple yeah, of yeah, cycles. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we have that data, and that will all be part of the, the package, and we'd be happy to have any early input before we, we um, face a broader audience uh, because we know there are going to be questions about the price tag and the need, and we're going in with our eyes open. Absolutely. Yeah. And we talked about this actually offline, both of, both of you, that, that a lot of other communities 
um, it just even in our area, uh, have significantly better uh, recreational facilities and athletic facilities. And so if you're thinking about it from a marketing your town and your region and thinking about not just why, why do students enroll here as opposed to somewhere else, but also just selling the quality of life of your area, the reality is, um, forgive me for saying this again on camera, but our facilities kind of suck compared to a lot of other uh, communities. We're, we're not up to par in any way, um, and we should, we should try to get there. That's our goal. Thank you all. We'll be back uh, sometime in April. I think you all, Mr. Mangano, others, all of us are going to be pretty busy during April and May. <laughs> I think there's some things coming up. So anyway, Possibly. we're happy to fit in wherever you think is appropriate through the chair. Yeah. Thank we're you. Working on it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Did you ever get through your slides, by the way? There's like 10 other slides you need to go through. Yeah. Are we good? <laughs> We just inter we interrupted you midway through, and you never finished your desk. I was kind of waiting for you to ask what year I graduated from Marist High School. <laughs> <laughs> Yours was definitely the earlier track, <laughs> like the way earlier track. <laughs> I don't think my high school had a track. Oh, yes, it did. Yeah, me too. Uh, okay, so uh, FY20 assessment formula vote. Um, So I was going to go through this really, really brief presentation and then do the assessment vote and the budget vote together, if that makes sense. Okay, very brief. Thank you. So the, the final proposed budget, there were some changes between um, the last time I presented and this time. And so the, the proposed budget now is $32,167,342, um, which is a 1.1% increase or 351991 over last year. Um, the net additions total 301,000, and the assessments now below the big change um, are now based on the compromise that we reached at the four town meeting. This is the list of assessments. Yes. This. Yep. And these have all actually been given to the towns because they need to start drafting more articles, so they have these numbers. Um, would you like me to go into the assessment formula? Or does everyone feel pretty good about that? Everyone feels pretty good about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the four major changes since the last time you saw it, the, the new assessment methodology, um, the language has been sent to DESE, and they've give us, given us sort of tentative approval for the language. Um, that's always a hold your breath kind of thing. Um, we've increased charter tuition revenue, so basically I've updated the estimate, still based on the, the charter, the proposed charter formula, so it's still conservative in a sense, um, but we originally went with the DESE number that they put out there based on the number of students they were projecting. They updated it based on what we're projecting, which is a, a few more students going out for charter just to be safe. Um, so that number came up a little bit. Um, there's some additions that we'll talk about on the next page that have changed a little bit. And we reduced the school choice fund supporting the budget to try to get that choice fund into a more sustainable level faster. And we'll, we'll look at a slide on that as well. Um, so proposed additions, the three highlighted yellow are the primary changes since last time. Um, so I'll go through them quickly. So the first one uh, is feedback from the committee about adding some supplies for restorative practices at the middle school. Um, we're we went with 5,000. We don't know exactly you know, what that's going to be comprised of, but in the past it's typically been books, materials, um, professional development, and trainings, and things like that. Um, so that would be specifically um, earmarked for the middle school. The second one is the math curriculum training support position we talked about last time. So what was in the budget last time was actually funds for sort of continued review of the math, but it wasn't a position. It was sort of on the cusp of when that math report came out. Um, so this number has been increased to actually make it a position, which was what was discussed last time, which we'd have a, a shared position between grade six through grade 12. Um, that would be sort of a temporary thing, but it would focus just on training and support for the math curriculum. Ms. Mayer? This makes no assumption as to the move from the sixth right. grade yeah, to no, the middle no, school. Yeah, no, no, this is not related to that. Yeah. I mean, it's related to it that it came from that report, but this specific thing doesn't depend on that. Um, so that ad was 15K before, and now it's 48 because it's being tied to a, a salary. Um, and then the last one is actually, it's under curriculum, and it's called clerical support, but it's actually related to the communications ad. So when we proposed the communications ad, um, you can see we, we called it communications and support because that, that position was going to be doing communications, but they were still also going to be supporting um, the curriculum director um, and scheduling and, and uh, organizing.
pricing contracts and things like that. Um, and so some of the feedback we heard last time around trying to create a dedicated communications position um, drove this change. So what this would do is it would add a overall a 0.4, but to the region just a 0.1 um, FTE to another temporary position to allow that person to support their curriculum director. And it would free up the communications position to just do communications for the district. Um, so it's for the region, it's a relatively small addition, but it would allow that position to focus on just communications. So those are the three ad changes. Um, there are a couple of little tweaks, but nothing um, significant. Um, one more slide. This essentially stayed the same. I think the staff turnover, we adjusted down a little bit, um, but this hasn't changed much. Um, one more. And so this was the school choice um, fund I was talking about. It's a little bit different picture than you've seen before. Um, so if you could just go to the green in FY20, we're projecting our beginning balance to be 422,000, um, which you can see is lower than it's been in the past. And so we're projecting to bring quite a bit based on what's coming up, um, and we're reducing how much we're using to support the budget um, from 575 down to 550, um, which will help us build up that balance faster um, to get up to around 550,000 for the end of FY20. I think, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Great. Oh, and one, sorry, sorry, one other, so one other general thing, so related to the um, conversation we just had with Mr. Zomek, just a reminder, two years ago we put $60,000 into stabilization fund to start trying to build up a reserve for the track, really, it was specifically for the track. Um, and this budget also includes another 70000 I think, or fifty or $70,000 um, as well, again, it's not a huge amount, so I think we'll have over maybe 100000 total. Um, and the cost is going to be much more than that, but we are trying to set aside some funds for the eventual something that we have to do to the fields. Right. Are there questions for Mr. Mangana? Just to yes. clarify, on, on the front, the first slide, the net budget is still 0 0.8. That's what we vote, That's what we looked at preliminarily, or...? I think that actually went down a little bit. I think at four town meeting it was a 0.88 assessment increase. I think it's a 0.85 <laughs> assessment increase. So the overall assessments, I believe, went down a little bit. Now, how they're distributed because we went with a different method may have changed in the last time. But okay. but the assessment increase is in the same ballpark. Okay. Great. Other questions? So if you go to the page that says amendment to regional agreement, uh, the starts that way, the school committee at the top. Uh, we have two motions unless you want to talk about debt assessment. Eventually. We'll talk uh, about it later? Uh, yeah, after. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Oh, well, if you want to oh. do it now, I mean, so there's two, there's two capital votes. Um, the debt assessment's new as of last year. Our new auditors asked that we just vote the debt assessment, even though it's sort of contractual at this point. Um, so that's what that first debt assessment vote is. And then the second vote on the capital, related to the capital plan, is for the roof proposal. Um, and it's, the wording's a little different this year because of the MSBA component. So there's some additional verbiage in there about the MSBA. And do, you, do you have a further presentation on the, I don't, on I don't the know. capital? It's a, no, it's the same okay. proposal. Well, why don't, we, why don't we take the first three that are on this page, and then we'll see if there are any questions from the committee on the capital vote before we do it. You're looking for a motion? I am looking for a motion. I'll move to amend section six of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement by adding subsection J as follows. For fiscal year 2020 only, the alternative operating budget assessment shall be calculated as 30% of a five-year average of minimum contributions with the remainder of the assessment allocated to the member towns in accordance with the per pupil method found in section 6E of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement. The five-year average of minimum contributions will include the five most recent years or take any other action relative there too. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read, taken by the raising your hand. Carries unanimously nine to zero. Uh, is there any further interest in speaking to a motion? Is there no news? Uh, I move to adopt the budget of 32167342 for fiscal year 2020 for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District and to assess member towns according to the method in the just approved amendment as follows. Amherst for 16444279 Pelham for 911736 Leverett for 1 
1,467,637. Shootsbury for 1,775,203. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. I don't know if the little piece below. Do you want to do the further voted? Oh. I think we did together last year. Yeah. Okay. Well, then moved and seconded. So um, we'll do that in a second. Okay. Are there any further questions on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand. Carries none to nothing. Is it honest? And I further move that included within this budget proposal is a contribution of $98,000 to the Special Education Stabilization Fund. Is there, is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and second. Quick explanation? Or does anybody want a quick explanation on that piece? Uh, sure. So the district has historically set aside $98,000 as sort of a placeholder for out-of-district tuitions. <coughs> and the change we made last year, since we have the Special Ed Stabilization Fund set up, is if during the year we don't use that, it automatically automatically will flow to the stabilization fund until we get a balance there. Right now, hopefully after this year, we'll, the same, that same thing that we voted this year, will, or the same thing we're voting next year happened last year. So that money should flow into that stabilization fund. Um, and we're trying to get a balance of around three or $400,000 in there um, as a safety net. You want to future. describe the special education stabilization fund? Yeah, so it's a, it's a stabilization fund that essentially is used for unanticipated special education costs. Um, to put money in there has to be voted during the this budget process, which is why it's spelled out specifically. Um, and then to access it, it has to be approved by the school committee, and it also has to be uh, approved by uh, the Board of Selectmen, which is sort of an interesting wrinkle. Um, so it would be there in case we have a placement that goes out mid-year that we didn't have funds for. Did we create this two years ago or one year ago? Uh, I think two years ago, but we, we weren't ago, able exactly. to fund it um, when we created it. We yeah, just, so the legislature authorized the ability of us to create funds like this, yeah. and then we did. And, it, and just to be clear, the district already budgets for, and that sounds dumb about this, but anticipated um, special education uh, expenditures, including out of district placements. But there's always the possibility uh, between now and then that um, we'll have enrollments, particularly people who move into town, where um, you then have an unanticipated expenditure. And so the question is where do you get the money from? So it's not a slush fund. It's restricted by a number of entities. Yes, I can't. It's, it's actually more restricted than just about any other type of fund because of the, the select uh, board member okay. vote. Yeah. Uh, is there any further discussion or questions on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously, nine to no, nothing. Uh, are there any questions on the debt assessment, Mr. Demley? Uh, you talked about um, the reupholstering of the auditorium chairs. Is that kicking into FY20? Are we get doing that this year? Or? So our plan is, to, so that's coming out of surpl um, surplus funds from FY19. So again, the savings from the health insurance surcharge going away is how we're trying to pay for that. Um, so it's not related to the debt, these debt assessments. Um, we're doing our best to get it done. It has to be done before June 30th because then the fiscal year switches over. Um, so. We're optimistic. We're working with the uh, Mass Corps, who's the group doing it, to firm up a timeline. There's a lot of um, entities that use the auditorium, so developing a timeline was not as easy as you would think in terms of making space and taking seats out. Uh, but our, yeah, our, our hope is to get that done this spring for both the high school auditorium and the middle school auditorium. So, and just, just to be clear, the item we're on right now is the debt assessment, which is for payments, the assessment to the different towns for payments on previously authorized right. and issued debt. Um, anyone feel like reading a motion? Read it. McDonald. I move to assess member towns for debt service on previously approved projects according to the debt schedule for FY20 as follows. Amherst, $294,160. Pelham, $24,054. Leverett, $35,382. And Shootsbury, 28,748. Is there a second? All second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on this item? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Carries nine to nothing. Now, uh, is there any explanation on the, any further <coughs> explanation on the capital plan bond authorization? Um, only that it hasn't changed since last time we're um, putting forward the <coughs> roof. Um, we'll find out about the MSBA piece in the late spring, summertime. And depending on how that hap that vote occurs or how the MSBA decides, we'll have to have a discussion whether if we don't get MSBA <coughs> funds, whether we go forward and do this project or if we wait. 
um, but that wouldn't change this vote here. Okay, are there any questions? Simon's got big lungs, good focus. <laughs> and also, just to be clear, we will do the voting and the further voting at the bottom. <laughs> Mr. Devlin. I do have one question. You do have a question. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, does the, the amount include any potential um, ability to put solar on the roof? Yeah, so the, the report we have from Gale um, pegged the roof replacement that we're proposing at about 2.4, 2.5 million. Um, so there is a buffer there that, you know, what I envision is possibly we put out bids where we get a base replacement cost and we get the, an enhanced um, replacement cost. And if that enhanced replacement cost is within our budget, then we could do it. If it's not, then we may have to have a conversation whether we try to increase the budget at that point. Um, th there's ways to do that through the procurement process. So. Um, so there is some uh, additional funds put in there for things like that. Forgive me for asking the question. I know you had like a some sort of internal working group or, or, or a group that was meeting on the question of whether we're going to put solar panels on the, on the middle school roof. Yeah. And what I was wondering is um, how do we kick the tires on this thing? Because right. I mean, the reality is I think there's, I mean, I think there's going to be interest in doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also going to be a big interest that if we don't ever bother asking the question, there's going to be huge interest to why we didn't. Um, so I'd like to I'd rather just get ahead of this. And if there's some group you want to organize that we could get a member of the school committee to, to join yeah. to just get, get on this issue, it would be great. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I met with me, uh, myself and the facility director, met with students and a teacher it's probably a few weeks ago and actually um, somebody from UMass about solar panels. Now, at the time, they're more focused on a canopy for our parking lot, um, but I think that would be the group that we'd want to engage. Um, what I would look for is if there's a, a member here who wants to be part of that group, I can get the meeting started, especially after the vote tonight. I think that would be a natural time to get that group reactivated. Um, but if there's a member that wants to be part of that, um, with myself, the facility director, there's a teacher at the high school, and the, um, in the past, it's been the environmental action group, um, which is a student activity group that focuses on this issue. Okay. Uh, well, let's, Mr. Green. The process question. Let's assume the solar panels come in at a prohibitively high cost. You spend two and a half million dollars. What happens to the other half million? So the, the panels themselves may not cost anything. There's, there's ways to buy panels or lease panels and, and have arrangements with panels where you don't actually pay anything for it. Um, really, the cost is actually... Um, building out the structure of our roof to support the weight of the of the panels. Okay. So you would just you would put that money into your roof and you'd have a stronger roof um, with no panels on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mr. Um is that little symbol red as paragraph in MGL C seventy one something sixteen D or is it section? Because it says section elsewhere. You're looking chapter to me on that one, I'm not sure. I'm looking for anybody on that one. I mean, <laughs> it's chapter, chapter 71. Section, section 20. Yeah, I think it's section. Yeah. Section, okay. Because it, yeah, it's funny because it's spelled out. Anyway. Oh, that was awesome. I move that the district appropriates the amount of $3 million for the purpose of paying costs of making roof repairs to the Amherst Regional Middle School, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, the project, which proposed re repair project would materially extend the useful life of the school and preserve an asset that otherwise is capable of supporting the required educational program, and for which the district is in the process of applying for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, set amount to be expended under the direction of the school committee. To meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the chair of the school committee, is authorized to borrow set amount under MGL Chapter 71, Section 16D, or pursuant to any other enabling authority. The district acknowledges that the MSBA's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA, and if the MSBA's Board of Directors votes to invite the district to collaborate with the MSBA on this proposed repair project, any project costs the district incurs in excess of any grant that may be approved by and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the district, and that if invited to collaborate with the MSBA on the proposed repair project, the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the district and the MS MSBA. Any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any such premium applied to the payment of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to the payments, payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with MGL Chapter 41, Section 20, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs 
by a like amount, and I further move that within seven days from the date on which this vote is adopted, the Secretary be and hereby is instructed to notify the Board of Selectmen or Town Council of each of the member towns of this district as to the amount and general purposes of the debt herein authorized as required by Chapter 71, Section 16D of the General Laws and by the District Agreement. Is there a second? Second. Um, I would note at the end of the par first paragraph, you said Chapter 41 instead of Chapter 44. Ah. I take as a friendly amendment that it, the rate is Chapter 44. So accepted? So accepted. Uh, great. Any further questions? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read. Carries nine to nothing. Thank you very much. And uh, anyone interested in volunteering to work on a <coughs> solar panel working group? When does it meet? <coughs> I don't know yet, but it's usually right after school. Pesky work career of mine pays the bills. <laughs> Sean will follow up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much, yes. Okay, so that uh, does our budget votes. Uh, we have <coughs> gifts. So accept gifts. Is it on us? Move to accept the following donations uh, from Daniel Giant to support flute, saxophone, and music stand for a high school music program, uh, estimated value $800. Uh, and from the American Chemical Society, check number 409609, awarded to the high school via Sharon Palmer for the science department in the amount of $500. Uh, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. Any questions on the items? Seeing none, all those in favor accepting the guest, the motion is read. Carries nine to nothing. It is unanimous. Um, so what I'm going to do on the school committee planning, we actually have a draft, um, a, not only agenda for the 26th that, Deb, you can send out tomorrow, yes. but also it included on it under school committee planning, uh, I don't want to call it, I guess I'll call it a parking lot, but a list of other items that were going to be scheduled in the subsequent meetings. So what we'd like you to do, like to do is have her send that out to the committee tomorrow you can see it, and if there are other items that um, we've missed or that you want to make sure are prioritized, uh, you can email um, me about it. And uh, if there's anything that you'd like to add in that regard right now, uh, I would welcome it. Seeing none, I would then entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Carries nine to nothing. We are adjourned. Wow. This might be a record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.